yeah, thank you very much indeed. Um, I hope this is what you wanted me to do, because it's a little bit less about subsistence than you may want, but we'll see. Uh, you'll also discover, I mean, I've, in my career, I've both been an economic historian and an ancient historian. I'm not an archaeologist, but I've usually worked with archaeological data. Uh, I'm, I'm currently officially an economic historian rather than ancient historian, which is just as well. Uh, so, the question, what did the Romans ever do for us? You all remember the Monty Python uh, scene. Uh, and I, indeed, I think few have nailed the fundamental question of Roman provincial history and archaeology with greater precision than the Monty Python team in their life of Brian, geniuses. Uh, to put it more academically, however, the question of Roman economic performance should indeed be the core of research on the Roman economy i.e. how well did Rome succeed in providing scarce goods and services to its population? And how does that performance compare with earlier and later periods of pre-industrial economic history or with other regions of the world, such as regions beyond the frontiers of the empire or a faraway empire such as China? I mean, I think that's the core of what we should be concerned with. However, for decades, this fundamental question has been ignored by ancient historians and to a lesser extent also by archaeologists. Until the mid-1960s, the dominant paradigm in ancient history had been that of the philological tradition that had isolated the study of Greco-Roman society from the dominant narratives and methodological advances in other periods of history. Ancient history was a backwater, decreasingly taken seriously by more modern historians or society at large, and quite rightly so. Who cares for that sort of history? This started to change in the 1960s, and the change owed much to the towering eminence of the late Sir Moses Finley. Educated in America, a political refugee to the United Kingdom when America had turned really vicious. Uh, and principally, as a social scientist, he began, to, he began to ask fundamental questions about the nature of ancient society, about antiquity's place in world history, and about our methodologies. How do we actually know what we think we know? For me, as a young student, it was a breath of fresh air. And at the first opportunity, I moved to Cambridge to work with him. Yet, that's the sting. For all its uniquely innovative work, his was also a very particular take on comparative social history. Steeped as he was in a very personal mix of neo-Marxist thought, he worked in the New York uh, uh, New School of Social Research in the 1930s, as, a, as an assistant, uh, with Weberian uh, thought, uh, sociology, and substantivist economic anthropology. As a result, classical antiquity was reduced to a relatively primitive forerunner in this model of stages of economic development, uh, without integrated markets, with only small-scale trade and manufacturing, and a low standard of living for the mass of the population. His explanation was a cultural one. This is the cultural turn early on. And we'll see wh how it, why it's wrong. The Greco-Roman elite disdained involvement in trade and manufacturing, and hence these potentially innovative sectors of the economy remained small and underdeveloped. If the rich don't do it, nobody will. The wealth that there was, and no one could deny that there was indeed quite a bit of wealth, given the splendor of elite residents, for example, in Pompeii, or impressive public buildings all over the empire, all this was ultimately the product of rent extraction by the greedy elite and the exploitation of the provinces. 
So in all, the composite picture of the Roman economy was a quite pessimistic one, unless you were rich. Standard of living of the mass of the population was and remained barely above minimum subsistence. There was little or no economic growth, and for many provinces, inclusion into the empire meant plunder and hardship. Easy to believe if you were in the 1960s and America was waging war in Vietnam. I mean, that sort of paradigm of empire came so easily to you. In contrast, in a kind of post-colonial discourse, pre-Roman society was often viewed as relatively successful. The resulting picture was necessarily a static one, and also implied that late antique decline was vastly exaggerated by earlier scholars. With Peter Brown, the world of late antiquity was one of transformation rather than decline. Now, methodologically, in Finley's view, and in line with his earlier mentor Carl Polanyi, the economic anthropologist at Columbia, the alleged absence of, an e of economic growth and innovation and of a market economy implied that modern economic analysis was useless as a tool. Antiquity was different. The gap between this and what other innovative social science historians were doing at the time was enormous. Think of the Annal School or the New Economic History in America. And as a result, or the demographic historians in Cambridge, and as a result, ancient history remained intellectually separate from mainstream historiography. And it still remained what Finley himself once had called a funny kind of history. Recent years have seen a major paradigm shift, however. And the shift has happened along two fault lines. The first were theoretical and methodological. The aversion to modern economic theory had created an unholy alliance between modern substantivist social science historians like Finley, traditional philologists who abhorred having to learn the mathematics of economics, and fashionable neo-Marxist claims for an alternative economic theory. The nutters. I guess, I guess my book on the economy and society of Pompeii was the first explicit critique of all this, and the first example by a professional ancient historian of how one might apply the logic of the dismal science of economics. I try to show that using modern economics doesn't immediately make antiquity into a mirror of the modern world. In fact, as many of you may know, uh, I used it to unravel the logic of Roman economic stagnation and underdevelopment. Now, that book was widely reviewed. It's very interesting to see what happens in, in, if you publish a book. It was widely reviewed, but the shift in theoretical paradigm was hardly noticed, noted by any reviewer, to my great disappointment. <laughs> and it wasn't even criticized. They should. However, all this did change in more recent years. The turning point was the work for the Cambridge Economic History of the Greco-Roman World and its publication in 2007. I think especially Ian Morris was very important in changing this, uh, this focus of the research. It reflected the two fault lines of the paradigm shift. The use of economics, even if an, an, in that book it was still largely of the sort of neo-institutionalist kind, uh, and the introduction of archaeological data into the debate on a scale not seen before. Although, to give Finley his due, I do remember very strongly as a PhD student in Cambridge that he did insist that using more archaeology would be the future of, th of, the, uh, of the debate. And he was extremely happy that he'd managed against a lot of opposition to, to persuade, to get Anthony Snodgrass to come to Cambridge, which was indeed the beginning of a lot of that sort of uh, new analysis. So he did see the alternative. Um, and indeed, the inclusion of the vastly increased corpus of archaeological data has critically changed the content of recent debate. 
from one that was mostly concerned with the paucity of data to one that needs to harness and think of tricks to harness an unheard of quantity of data in a systematic way. We have a new problem and we haven't really woken up yet to the challenge. Not surprisingly, therefore, aggregate statistical analysis has become a highly productive tool, changing both the ancient historian's apprehension about statistics and challenging the post-processual uh, dislike for generalization and their insistence on the unique and the individual. That's the beauty of aggregate statistical analysis. You can overcome all this nonsense. Uh, in short, I think we, ancient historians and archaeologists, have finally become grown-up members of the historical discipline. Now, let me get it some... So, how can we understand the Roman economy? And what does an economist want to know about an early economy? Now, what are the most important variables to know? Where should we focus our research? And how can we know about them? And what have we learned about them? And what we have not yet learned about them, but should or would like to know? The most important variable in human history is quite simply that of human population number. How many people were there and how does that relate to resources and to aggregate output in particular? Remember, per capita income equals total production and con or consumption divided by the number of people. So it, population is the numerator for most of the, the, the sums that matter. The long-term trend in human history has been decidedly upwards and in Increasingly so. This graph shows population estimates by McEfferty and Jones, the most commonly used numbers, even if they are actually, of course, very, very speculative. And represented here, I remind you, on a semi log scale. Now, the value of the semi log scale is that the same growth rate, i.e., the relative change, is represented by the same slope of the curve. If you don't do this, uh, if you have a, a linear scale, nothing happens in human history until 150 years ago. So this one is much more useful. Um, but what the graph shows is that for a long time, the planet was actually pretty empty. That this only began to increase in the Bronze Age, and that after that, not only did absolute population numbers grow more and more, but also that the growth rate accelerated, because the slope is getting steeper, particularly since the Industrial Revolution. Now, of course, the Industrial Revolution really is a turning point in human history. Uh, there are only two really important parts of human history. One is the Neolithic Revolution, and the other is the Industrial Revolution. And much in between is... <laughs> Now, for the classical period, it's a little bit interesting. For the classical period, the graph also suggests a kind of elevated plateau, as you can see. But the underlying data are, of course, not very good. This is really pretty crappy stuff. Uh, but anyway, the estimate for world population at the beginning of the modern era here is 170 million. And that is actually a very, very low estimate. So raise it, and the, the elevation of the elevated plateau is even higher, of course. Uh, 170 million implies the rough, that roughly a third of world population lived in the Roman Empire, which is a, a remarkable thing when we have no modern state that has a third of world population. Uh, another third or a bit less in Han China, so that's actually a very interesting comparison. But it's difficult, of course, because we don't know Chinese, and the people who, don't, who know Chinese don't know Latin. <laughs> uh, and yet another third in the rest of the world. Wow. Two-thirds of world population living in two big empires. For the Roman Empire, this, is, this, this estimate, of course, is based on the relatively low estimates by Julius Beloch from about a century ago. We haven't really done much 
in the meantime to improve on this. But fortunately nowadays, Baylor's estimates are increasingly criticized with alternative estimates up to about 90 to 100 million for the Roman period. It's important to note, however, that these estimates are little more than pretty wild guesses without much in the way of hard empirical data. Also, they tend to be quite static. If you look at Agnes Madison's uh, reconstructions of world economic history, he just has sort of one moment in time, uh, the Augustan age, and that represents all of Roman history. Uh, as if nothing ever changed. Now, of course, in Finley's analysis, nothing ever did change, so why not? But he may be wrong. Uh, because these, these analyses pretending to be valid for long periods of time. However, and that's where you guys come in, recent archaeological research has begun to address both problems using field survey data. The method is to assign hypothetical population numbers to particular site types and multiply these by the number of sites of that type. Lisa Fentris was the first to do this for the Albania Valley in Italy, and the Groningen team, Timon is there, uh, has now applied the same methodology to their data for the Netuna area in the Pontine region. Now, the absolute numbers are, of course, guesses that depend on many known unknowns and unknown unknowns. But it's important to note that the trends in relative change over time are far more secure. And the trend that we see is pretty clear. A dramatic rise in population, particularly from the late 4th and early 3rd century. This growth probably reached its peak in the later 2nd century AD or thereabouts, to then move in pretty dramatic reverse. Decline and fall were steep. Once again, decline and fall is actually perhaps a good way to look at Roman history. The second thing that you can see in this graph is that population trends in these two regions roughly moved in sync. A few years ago, Alessandro Lanaro had already observed the same for many other Italian surveys, even if not using this more sophisticated analysis. Conceptually, Conceptually, this is a wake-up call to abandon the tradition to avoid generalization, instead looking for differences in what I like to call my valley is, a, is different syndrome. I think that's characteristic of the research tradition in archaeology. I'm smarter than you are. My valley is different, so my data are, are unique. I'm not interested in unique valleys. Of course, regional differences matter, but primarily in relation to a general trend. But then I'm a historian, of course. If we don't identify that larger trend, we cannot even identify what is locally specific. Therefore, three survey teams working around Rome, the British School at Rome's Tiber Valley project, the Suburbium project at La Sapienza, and the Groningen Pontine region project have now joined forces to integrate their data sets. Here is one, the Pontine region project. That's the Suburban project. And that's the Tiber Valley project. And I don't need to tell you that the... Sh okay, okay, no, 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 sorry. My ambition is to extend this to other parts of first Italy and then the empire to reconstruct the big story of Roman population trends, rural social relations and material culture. For the provinces, I want to show you a graph for, from a forthcoming article by Xavier de Rue with site numbers from northeastern France, Luxembourg and Germany. The clever trick here was to convert the data into index numbers to make them comparable. And I don't need to tell you that the shape of this settlement graph is quite similar to that of the regional Italian population trends. This is just settlement numbers rather than population numbers. But even so, I think the combined image is very clear. 
And I'm quite sure that many, though probably not all parts of the empire, will show a similar trend of considerable population growth, followed by equally dramatic decline, even if that decline may well be later in, for example, the Roman East. For the Roman West, I also want to show you an altogether different graph, created by Andreas Zimmermann and his team in Cologne, using exceptionally good data from the Braunkohl region west of the Rhine. Now, what these data lack is the chronological resolution of the other set, sets that I showed you, but it could be done for these data too. Uh, what they have in their favour, of course, is the exceptionally long time frame. And it's precisely that long time frame that shows that the Roman period is indeed extraordinary. Roman history actually matters. And not just in central Italy, but also in a faraway province. Oh, I'm going to need more, I'm sorry. This population boom and the subsequent decline are perhaps the most important things one can say about the Roman economy and its identification is really quite a recent thing. I think it represents the complete refutation of the static paradigm of a pre-industrial Rome. The next question is, of course, what such a population boom meant for the economy. As I said earlier, per capita income is the result of dividing aggregate production consumption by the number of people. If the aggregate production and consumption went up to the same degree as population, per capita incomes obviously remained the same. But it's not necessarily the case. Uh, let me show you the next slide. This is a slide by uh, Bob Allen uh, on of the extent to which uh, people's incomes exceeded subsistence. It's the welfare ratio, he called it. And what you can see is that after the Black Death in the 14th century, w when thereafter population started to increase again, incomes have actually been declining all the way to quite recently. People have got worse and worse and worse. And the only exceptions are the Netherlands and, in and the south of England. Uh, Now, theoretically, it's not surprising that incomes went down uh, because a pre-industrial economy is essentially a system with two factors of production, land and labour. After two, land is in more or less inelastic supply, so population growth changes the land-labour ratio. Inevitably, this means uh, that labour productivity will go down. Marginal labor, marginal labor productivity. If you, if you have two, twice as many people on the same plot of land, uh, you may increase your production, but it won't double. So the more people you have on a plot of land, the poorer they will be, everything else being equal. So population pressure depresses standards of living. You can only escape with technological change of one kind or another i.e. you move not along the production function, but you actually move the production function itself. Uh, technological change of one kind or another, different crops, machines, whatever. Better management, better institutions. <coughs> so we now want to know what happened in the Roman world to incomes. Did people actually become more prosperous? This is a set of wage data from Roman Egypt, recently published by Carl Harper in Journal of Economic History. And what you can see is that until the Antonine Plague, that's the first of these vertical lines, uh, incomes were effectively two, three times above subsistence. Not bad at all. Uh, after the Antonine Plague, by and large, not only the data become much rarer, people stop producing documents society is collapsing, uh, but also incomes were lower. And the declining slope, of course, is the regression line between all these dots. And you, think, you can see people were getting worse off later on. Uh, but they are not still very good data. So we're back to Monty Python. Um, 
the best data I think that we have to some extent are um, archaeological and I want to show you a few examples of these archaeological data. I was talking earlier about uh, high income elasticity goods. Meat consumption is one of those. Meat produce, I mean that's expensive calories. You can only eat more meat if you're more prosperous. So if meat consumption increases, it shows uh, basically not only, as some social psychologists would argue, that people were becoming uh, less kind. No, 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 no. They're more prosperous. This is prosperity growth under a magnifying glass. And this is archaeological animal bone assemblages from Roman provincial sites. And you can see, with the advent of Romans, meat arrived on the table and started to disappear again in later antiquity. And it's not the only change, of course, in diet. There are quite a few other data sets on fruits and vegetables that show similar patterns. Wine consumption, you name it, there's quite a lot of that. Uh, Similarly, we have Andrew Wilson's, come here, oh, uh, oh yeah, there is this, this one, is. people were, are also, of course, beginning to live better in uh, nicer houses in the Roman period than before, or that they would do afterwards. And a very fascinating example was window glass from Tilpasavai. I mean, a stupid little village, it, no, <laughs> in nowhere and yet there's a piece of window glass and it's not the only piece of window glass from the provinces uh, this is whatever uh, another example wood, building wood for house construction etc as a clear peak in the uh, uh, the data from the Rhineland suggesting a much increased uh, construction activity uh, in the region. Okay. Uh, yeah, so let me... No, let, 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 let's stop here because you're really... I really have to stop now. Okay. Thank you. Ah.